church uh, good morning uh, my name is Sam so uh, if you don't know me which I don't know a lot of you um, I uh, was just talking to uh, Pastor Kyle and he invited me to uh, come and lead worship this morning and so um, excited to be here and I uh, just want to introduce myself so anyways we're gonna get right into it so here we stand with us as we worship together as we Feel free to put your hands together if you want. Thank you. 
the, the lyric of that last verse up just for one more second. Good morning, I'm Pastor Kyle. I am so glad that you were with us in the house of God this morning. Man, I don't know about you, but I just got stirred up singing the words that. So let's put that back up there for one second. Uh, no, so he, is, he is freedom. He is, he is, and he is healing <laughs> right now. He is hope and joy and love, peace and life. That is what Jesus offers each and every one of us right now. You can receive that right now. You don't have to wait until the end of the service. You don't have to wait until the end of the song. You can cry out to Jesus right now. Say, I need you. I've made a mess of things. I need your presence. I need your peace. I need your wisdom. I need you. It's how incredible. Sometimes we take it for granted. I take it for granted. Here's another Sunday. We're going to go to church. Because we love Jesus, we're just going to go to church. You know, we're not just going to church. We are a church, and we are meeting together. We get to meet with Jesus together today. So I don't know what you walked in these doors facing. I don't know what faces you on the other side of these doors. For some, it's difficulties, it's challenges. You're not sure what you're going to do. But right now, right now, we have this moment. This moment can change everything. That is not hyperbole. That's not me just preaching. That is the reality that, that the spirit of the living God is in this room meeting with his people. And if you want to receive from just, I want to encourage you for something. This is going to be new. I've never done this. I'm going to ask that you would consider raising your hands in worship. Let's do that. If you're comfortable, would you do that with me? Even if you're a little uncomfortable, would you do that with me too? Okay? I realize it's a scratch. Some of you are like, okay? But Father God, we thank you. Father God, we, we thank you. Right now, our hands are raised in surrender. We're saying we can't do this on our own. We never could. We never could. We need your presence. We need you to meet with us right now. Otherwise, all of this is worthless. This is a waste of time if we don't meet with you. If we don't experience your presence. If we don't hear, hear your voice from heaven. So God, these next few moments, we just, we just dedicate to you. We pray, would you come and do what only you can do? We love you. We're going to worship you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together. Amen. Let's worship together. Oh, 
Thank you for the power of your blood. 
Sometimes we sing songs like this, and we just kind of, we just sing it. But I want us to take a moment, ask ourselves, and ask the Lord, is there anything that I'm allowing to hold me back? Is there anything that's keeping me from really connecting with Jesus, with really experiencing all that he has for me? Could be worry, could be worry, could be shame, could be guilt, could be an unresolved relational situation that we haven't done our part to mend things. I, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it well, is. I want you to, let's take a moment right now. I want to invite you to close your eyes. Whatever it is that's holding you back. The scripture says that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate us. The only thing that can separate us is ourselves. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If you open it up, we have to open that door. And some are afraid to open the door to Jesus because they're afraid of what Jesus will see and, and the enemy is whispering lies in their ear. So whatever it is, whatever is holding you back, will you just release that? Will you just say, Jesus, I, I, I can't fix this. I can't solve this. None of my effort, none of my, none of my good works can fix this. I need you to do in my heart and my life what you've always wanted to do. We just surrender right now. Let's sing that, that chorus one more time. Nothing. Thank you, Jesus. No, nothing is holding me back from you. Redeemer of my soul. Now nothing can hold me back from you. never lets us go, a love that is sure, a love that won't leave us or divorce us or die on us, not a faithful love. And Lord, this morning we grab a hold of you with both hands. We're not going to hold anything back. We're not going to hold on to anything but you, Jesus. And we ask that during these moments we have, with you, during these moments with the family of God, would you fill us with your hope? and your courage and your presence, would you speak to our hearts so that we can walk out those doors with different people because of our time with you. We love you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for engaging. Yeah. Thank you for engaging in worship with us this morning. Worship, you guys are amazing. We love you guys. Thanks so much for leading us. Real quick, before you find a seat, why don't you turn around and greet someone nearby. We'll be back in just a moment.
Well, good morning again. Come on and find a seat. I don't know about you, but for me, I always have a struggle. Like, how far back should I go and keep greeting like, before, like, you know, someone comes up here and starts talking, you know? If you're an introverted person, you don't have that problem while you're like, you know, then we'll just answer. That, that's okay. Hey, welcome to Vantage Point Church. I'm Kyle. Pastor Kyle, I am glad that you were with us this morning. Uh, in the seat back in your bike, there should be a connect card. I want to encourage you, especially if this is your first or second time with us, you're visiting with us, please let us know that by filling out a connect card, and you can drop it off at our connect table. It's on the lobby. It's, that's the only table there that's, that's in the lobby. And if you are visiting with us, we want to give you our Vantage Point coffee mugs. Filled with water, but you know, anyhow, you know. Well, uh, if you're more of a digital person, we also have our digital connect card. Or you can just text the word welcome to the number that's on the screen. And I say this all the time, don't worry, we're not going to spam you with a ton of emails or text messages. This is just a way for us to stay in touch with you and let you know about what's going on here in our community and uh, in our church. I want to encourage Opportunities. At this time, I wanted to take a moment and highlight our offering. Uh, if you'd like to give today, there are offering. Stop them from giving because you love being a part of this church and you love seeing what God is doing. I can't wait because this fall we're going to be highlighting some testimonies and sharing some stories. Some of you, sometimes you kind of wonder, what are my resources going to? We want to share that with you this fall with some testimonies because you, so you can be, you know, just amazed at all that God is doing. So I just want to say thank you for your faithfulness in giving. If you'd like to give, uh, we have the, the giving boxes on the back wall on your way out at the end of the service. You can just drop them off in one of the blue boxes. Let me take a moment to pray for the offering and then we'll move on to the next part of our service. Let's pray together. Father, it is amazing that you invite us to be a part of what you're doing in this world, that we're not just spectators, we're not uh, helpless victims, but we get to be partners with you to make an impact, to see lives changed in our community and around this world. We pray that you would bless this offering, or that you would use it to reach many more people. In Jesus' name, amen. When I grow up, I want to file all day. I want to climb my way up to middle management. Be replaced on a whim. I want to have a brown nose. I want to be a yes man. Yes woman. Yes sir. Coming sir. Anything for a raise, sir. When I grow up, when I grow up, I want to be underappreciated. To be paid less for doing the same job. I want sunshine rolled up my dress. Well, hey, we are starting a brand new series today called fit called fit and i'm excited it's going to be a great series and as we get going let me just ask you a little question before we before we kind of dive in what did you want to be 
When you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up, when you were a little kid, okay? I want you, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to ask you to talk to somebody. So kind of get geared up for that. Some of you are like, oh, I don't want to do that. So get ready. In a second, I want you to share with a neighbor what you wanted to be when you were a kid, when you grew up, okay? Are you ready? Can we, we can do this. Okay, one, two, three, share. Uh, So many great answers. I heard uh, auto body. I heard a nurse. Uh, Someone mentioned a veterinarian. Um, I heard brain surgeon, which is kind of amazing. But you know what's funny? I didn't hear a single person say anything those people on the video said. Isn't that surprising? Like, not a brown noser amongst you. Anyhow. But it it is amazing because when we are kids... When we're kids, we believe that, that we're destined for greatness. You know, whether it be like, you know, in professional sports, you want to be a, a basketball star or an astronaut, we believed that we were, we were made to make a difference, to, to, have, to do meaningful things. You know, where does that come from? Why is it that every little kid you talk to, they have something big on their hearts? You know, they, they believe that they could do something really big with their lives. Where does that come from? I think that is the thumbprint of God on our lives. That God has made each and every one of us with purpose and meaning. And, and, and it comes from, from Scripture. If you have a Bible handy this morning, I want you to turn to Psalms 139. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to have the verses on the screen. And let me just kind of give you a heads up right away. Uh, this is an introduction. And so what that means is is we're going to kind of just introduce the topic and kind of, you know, unpack what it looks like. If you're, you're really, you know, you want to dive deep into Scripture, I want to encourage you to come back in, in next week and the week after. We're going to really dive into some, some Scripture. This is kind of a more, as I said, an introduction, okay, to kind of set the table for what we're going to be talking about during this series. But it's amazing. When we're kids, we just kind of intuitively know that we're unique, that, that we're special, that there's something about us that we have something to offer the world, that there's a, there's a perspective. Kids have, have an incredible perspective on life. I mean, all you have to, to, to see, all you have to do to see that is, is talk to some kindergartners, okay? I know some kindergarten teachers, and it's amazing. You ask kindergartners to draw just a simple picture, you will, you, you will not get a simple picture, okay? You might get some scribbles, but, but if you ask them to draw something simple like a house, draw your house, it's amazing. They'll, they'll draw their house, you know, but there's like dinosaurs in the front yard. You know, and there's like a pink and purple polka dotted, you know, car in the driveway. Why? Because every kindergartner sees the world in a unique way. Kids have have a unique perspective. Not two kindergartners see the world the same way. In fact, I saw a study not too long ago that um, followed some elementary age kids all the way up through high school. And they asked them a variety of questions. And one of the questions they asked them is, are you creative? Are you creative? And so they asked a group of second graders, are you creative? And out of those second graders, 95% said, yes, I'm creative. I'm a creative person. They waited a few years, and they asked them again in fifth grade. And in fifth grade, 50% said they were creative. Then they asked them again as they were getting ready to graduate high school in 12th grade. And in 12th grade, only 5% of those same kids would describe themselves as creative. See, as we get, as we get older, this idea that, that we're unique, that we have something unique to offer the world, something that is unlike anyone else, it tends to erode. We tend to, to try to fit in with those around us. We don't want to stand out. We don't want to, we don't want to make waves. We don't want to cause a scene. Sometimes we can tend to, to blend into the background. 
But my goal during this series is I want to reawaken something in us that maybe for some you haven't felt since you were a little kid. I want to stir that God-given sense of wonder, that, that you were made to make a difference, that you were uniquely designed by God, that, that his thumbprint is still on your life even if you can't see it any longer because of some of the smears that we've caused in our own lives. Let's look at scripture, okay? Psalms 139. We'll start with verse 13. I'm reading out of the message translation, so it may sound a little different. It says this. It says, you made my whole being. You formed me and knit me together in my mother's body. I will praise you because I am made in amazing and wonderful ways. Another translation says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That, I, I was reading that this morning as we met with our volunteers for the service, and it kind of hit me for the first time. <clears throat> I had heard those verses so often. But when you stop and think that God, God was doing something and he did it fearfully, meaning, meaning with a sense of awe, with a sense of intentionality with what he was doing. You know, if I were to approach a power tool, like a very large power tool, first of all, some of you, you should, you should stop me, but that's a different story. Um, but <laughs> I would do so fearfully, okay? I would do so with a sense of awe of what I'm doing and, and the, the power of what I'm doing has, God approached making your life fearfully with a sense of awe and wonder. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. You saw my bones being formed as I took shape in my mother's body. When I was put together there, you saw my body as it was formed. All the days planned out for me were written in your book before I saw, before, one, before I was one day old. Do you notice the, yeah, do you notice the, the, the words in this passage? Something kind of stands out. They are all very intentional words. I mean, think about it. Made, planned, shaped, formed. These are all intentional words. God made you on purpose. Okay, God, he, he, he wanted you, not just the person sitting next to you, not the person who, who married well or did well in school or has a great career or things all went the way they, they planned they were going to go. No, he wanted each and every, God made you on purpose. Your life is intentional. It is not accidental. Okay, th there may be some accidental parents out there, you know, some parents that, that you know, had, had a, they would say a, a whoops or maybe they'd say it, it was an accident. There may be some accidental parents, and there may be some people that probably shouldn't be parents, but there are absolutely no accidental children. There really aren't. You may not have been planned by your parents, but you were 100% planned by God. Okay? He planned for you to be here. Every day written in his book before you were a day old. Which is why abortion and suicide is such a tragedy. And, and I know... There's a lot wrapped up in that. And I know in our culture right now, we're having conversations that we should be having, although it's very difficult because no one wants to have a conversation. People want to just yell at each other. But, but that is why abortion and, and suicide is such a tragedy because here we have the most incredible artist ever, a master artist, and, and we are ripping the paintbrush out of his hand. In fact, scientists now know they know more. That, that we, I mean, just the ultrasound is incredible. We know more than we did in the 70s. We know that now, the scientists know that, that the genetic makeup, that the, the genetic makeup that, that makes you, you, that makes you a person is there at conception. The only difference is size and development. It's the only difference. God made us with purpose. He made us with purpose. You are handcrafted and original. God likes originals. I, I like originals too. You know why? Because originals hold more value. Okay, they really do. I mean, if you were to go to a museum and, and see a, a great uh, work of art, you know, the, the Mona Lisa or some of the great work of art, you could go and there it is. It's like under glass, like heavy, thick glass, and they have security guards. You had to pay money to go and see this. But you know what's crazy? I could go to one of these, these museums and take out my phone and take a picture of it. And I would have the exact same image, wouldn't I? Like it'd be on my phone. Or I could go to the gift shop and I could buy a poster of the Mona Lisa. I could get it on a keychain or a coffee mug. But it's not going to have the same value, is it? Why? Because the original was handcrafted by an artist 
a great artist took something that, that didn't exist anywhere, it only existed in their mind, and they created and put it into reality, into the world, an original. Okay, our God makes originals. All you have to do is look at nature. Nature is full of originals. God could have just phoned it at some point. Granted, I mean, there are a lot of things that do taste like chicken. But when it comes to design, <laughs> when it comes to design, just look at the animal kingdom. There, there are so many incredible examples of this. Look at this picture, this guy. Okay, this is the, the red, red-lipped batfish. That is its name. Okay, I think we're just like naming things like what they look like. The red-lipped batfish. I think I went on a date. Never mind. Um, okay, here's another one. Okay, let's look at this one. That, that is a starfish mole, uh, mole. Starfish mole. No, that is a thing of nightmares. <laughs> Take it off. Get, get rid of that. I can't even look at it. You're all going to not see. God makes originals. Scientists have found that in one cubic foot of snow, there are 18 million snowflakes, and each of them are, are different from, from the other. Hey, there's not two snowflakes that are exactly alike, They're, which I, I imagine during creation, you know, by all the angels kind of huddle around God. Hey, what are you up to? I'm making snow, which like, everybody in the Midwest is like, why? But anyhow, <laughs> and God, the angels are like looking at what God's doing and like, yeah, each one's unique. And like, why God, what do you do? Why would you do that? I mean, if they hold out a finger, it's going to melt and they're, they're not even going to know. Well, you're just kind of showing off now. God makes originals. I mean, there's no one on the planet that is just like you. No one. I mean, they may have similar interests and similar hobbies. You may have a doppelganger. You know, I know I have a doppelganger. I look just like this guy. Everybody tells me that. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> take it down. But no one shares the exact same DNA. Even if you're a twin, okay, your twin doesn't have the exact same DNA. They don't have the same fingerprints, okay? It is amazing. Why? Because you were made on purpose, born for this time, set in your context, made to make a unique contribution. But you know where the problem comes in? Is so many people, I'd say most people, somewhere along the line, they don't believe that. They believe there's something wrong with them. There's something wrong with, with God's design. They don't like things about themselves. And that's not to talk about the scriptural design, how God designed us as, as humans. Okay, that's a whole other side of the coin. But there are so many people, they look at themselves, they look at their qualities and attributes, say, I, I don't like this about me. I, I wish I was thinner. I wish I was taller. I wish I was more athletic. And then we compare ourselves to others. Well, I wish I was more outgoing like her. She's always like the life of the party and everyone looks like they're having fun. And then that person might think, I wish I had more, more poise like her. I, I'm always putting my foot in my mouth. I wish I was more calm and together, keep like making a mess of things. Isn't that amazing? I wish I was smarter. I, I wish I was, I was better with people like he is. And we live in a culture that loves to kind of just tease that out of us, doesn't it? loves to kind of draw those things out of us and we'll highlight our insecurities and say, well, you need to be like this if you want to be happy or successful. And good news, if you buy my product, <laughs> if you subscribe to my, my, my podcast or my website, then, then you'll be happy. Then you'll be fulfilled. And because of that, we are constantly finding faults with ourselves, comparing ourselves to others, conforming ourselves in these little tiny boxes like everyone else, what we think we're supposed to be. And the result is so many frustrated, dissatisfied people, dissatisfied lives. Why? Because in kindergarten, we started out as originals <laughs> with, with pink polka dot cars. And now we're carbon copies of everyone around us. And when we do that, the world misses out on what God has for us. The world misses out. They don't get to see God's incredible design. Let's look at another scripture verse. We'll throw this on the screen. You can write this down. We're going to jump into this one a little bit more next week. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, Together we are the body of Christ, and each of us are members of that body. I love that. It says, it says when we come together, this is, this is incredible. When we wrap our brains around this, when we come together, not just here in Plasterville, not just in this room, churches all across our account all across the world, when we come together, 
We collectively, we are the body of Christ. And each and every one of us, we're members of that body. When we come together, we get to show the world what Jesus looks like, how Jesus treats one another, how Jesus does marriage and family and, and, and what forgiveness looks like. When we come together and, and we use our gifts and our strengths and our talents and our stories, we show the world Jesus. But when we don't come together, when we say, well, I can't do it the way they do it. You know, I, they're really outgoing. I'm more, more quiet, introverted, so I guess I can't be a part of that. When we sideline ourselves, what we show the world is we show the world a deformed mutation, just kind of hobbling around. And the world looks at that. The world looks at how church is done a lot of times. Why would I want to be a part of that? <laughs> I got enough conflict in my life, okay? I got enough backbiting in my life. I got enough whatever it is. Why would I want to be like that? But when we come together, we show the world what Jesus is really like. Amen. See, if we all had the same heart, the same talents and gifts, think about everything that would be left undone. I mean, if the entire church were like me and had my gifts and talents, don't think about that too much. You know, like, like no one, how many people would be left unfed or would have you know, food poisoning if I tried to cook something, okay? It would not be pretty, okay? I can make pancakes most days. Okay, I mean, worship, if, if, if the church all had my skills and we are looking for a, a, a worship director to take our worship to the next level because we value coming into the presence of God and worshiping with all our hearts. We are, we are pursuing that position, so know that. We, we take that seriously. But if I were to stand up here and lead worship, well, first of all, our services would be a lot shorter, <laughs> right? And uh, we all be making a joyful noise, maybe. Anyhow, <clears throat> but come on, there, there are songs that are yet, have yet to be written. There are businesses that have yet to be started. There are projects that need to be done. There are children that need to be comforted and taught. There are, there are plans that need to be designed. And because God is waiting for us. He's waiting for us because you have been uniquely designed and shaped by the hand of God to do these things he's putting on your heart. For some, there's something God's put on your heart and you've kind of put it in the back burner for a long time. So you're like, is he talking to me? You're not the only one, okay? God has been speaking to your heart and saying, no, no, it's not time. It's not, I don't know, I don't know enough. I don't have enough finances. I've made some mistakes in the past. Come on, God is speaking to your heart. Ephesians 2.10 says, we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to, to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance to do. The reality is, is there, there are some things that if you don't do it, it's not gonna be done. There are some, some dreams that God has that he's, he's spoken to you with your unique experiences, your unique giftings, that if you don't do it the way God made you, it's not going to happen. I think of Moses. It's amazing. We, we had a missionary here last week talked about Moses a little bit and how, how the children of Israel had been groaning in slavery for 400 years. It says God heard their groans. He didn't just kind of randomly choose somebody. Oh, oh, here's a guy standing around over here. I'll have him rescue my people. No, he had Moses be born. He was born for that moment, for that time where the calling on his life, God called him to do that. You know, it's funny. Even if maybe you had some parents or teachers or people in your life growing up, they may have said, why can't you be more like, right? You, okay, anybody here? Why can't you be more like your brother, you know? Why can't you be more like your sister-in-law? Or whatever, why don't you, whatever it is. You know, the amazing thing is when we get to heaven, your heavenly father is not going to say, why weren't you more like, you know, you know what he is going to say? He's going to say, why weren't you more like you in your life? Why weren't you more like the you I made you to be? Instead of trying to be like your sister. Instead of trying to, to be like that coworker. You know, there are people say, oh, this guy, this guy's really great. He's going to be the next Elon Musk. He's going to be the next Michael Jordan, which that's a lie because there will never be another Michael Jordan. But that's another thing. Okay, what? be the next Billy Graham. That is not true about them and is not true about you because God doesn't need another Michael Jordan or Billy Graham or Elon Musk on the planet. But what he does need is he needs me and you being fully the person God's called us to be. Amen. He needs you. He needs you in this time, in this context, in this moment of human history. Job 10, verse 8 says this. 
Scripture says, your hands formed and shaped me. Your hands formed and shaped me. It's not just talking about body image, not, not just about hair color or, or eye color or things of that nature, but every aspect. God shaped us. How? How did God shape us? Let's look at this, this picture. It kind of gives an example. A little, um, what is it? I, not a, what do you call a, a word? Acrostic. That's right. See, we need each other. Okay. <laughs> shape, an acrostic for the word shape. Thank you for helping me out. Okay. Our God, he, he develops our spiritual gifts. He gives us, if you're a believer, you have gifts that God has given you, spiritual gifts. Okay. He develops our heart. Those things, there are things you care about that others could care less about. There are things that break your heart. There are things that make you really angry. Chances are your spouse knows what those things are because you complain to her about it. It's just me. Okay. Okay. God develops our heart. He draws out our abilities. There are, there are talents that you've worked to develop. There are giftings and abilities that you have in your life. He animates our personality, right? Some are extroverts. Others are introverts. And God wants to use, and there's so much more to it than that. We're going to be talking about that. He wants to use your personality. Your personality is not a, something that hinders you. Oh, I'm just this. No, no, no. It was designed by God to make a difference. Okay. <laughs> there are sometimes that a quieter person will learn a whole lot more about a situation. And when they speak, you better listen. Because they've been thinking about what they're, we're going to get into all that here in the weeks to come. Okay. And he allows experiences, some good some bad, some experiences that are difficult that we would never want to go through again. And yet those experiences shape us and God doesn't waste our tragedies. Okay, we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world. <clears throat> and I can't explain everything that happens. It would be insensitive for me to try. But I know this, God will use every heartache. He will use every tragedy. He will use every mistake if we offer it to him. Okay? Our shape, the shape that God has given us. <clears throat> and we're going to be taking some time over the next couple of weeks to really dive into that and to, to kind of explore what scripture has to say about how God shaped us, how he made us in unique ways. And we're going to do that prayerfully. And, and we're going to be asking the Lord, God, would you show us what you've been up to in our lives? Because here's the reality whether you realize it or not, whether, whether you've been a believer for a long time or you're kind of just checking things out, the reality is, is God has been invested in your story since before the beginning, right? He was knitting you together in your mother's womb. He is invested in your story. And, and he has things, he's been up to something in your life. You're like, well, when we stop, and some of you have been around, the, been around for a little while, you can look back at your life and you kind of piece some of these things together. Well, okay, this happened when I was in second grade. And then that caused us to move over here. And then I developed an interest in that. And then the, the door got closed over there. So I did this instead. It kind of was a fluke. And you can look back and you can see, wow, God, God's hand was in all of this. He was weaving together an entire story. God has been involved in every part of it. Amen. One last scripture verse. Jeremiah 1, verse 5. <clears throat> Once again, this is out of the message translation. It says, before I shaped you in the womb, I knew all about you. Before you saw the light of day, I had holy plans for you. A spokesman to the nations, that's what I had in mind for you, speaking to Jeremiah. Your father knows all about you. This wasn't just for Jeremiah. He knows all about you, the good and the bad, the things that you're ashamed of and the things that, that fills you with, with godly pride. He knows all about that, and it says... He has holy plans for you. You owe it to yourself to find out what those plans are. I mean, even if you reject those plans, even say, no, no, I'm going to do this instead. This seems like it'd be more fun. It seems like it'd be more, you, would you, don't rob yourself of at least finding out what the plans are. Okay, I saw a dumb internet video, okay, which I think most internet videos are dumb. And a kid went into a pawn shop and, and the guy had a DVD he was going to sell for three bucks. And he said, well, I can give you three bucks or I can give you what I have in this mystery box. And, and the guy said, well, no, I'm, we're in my business. I can't do that. Are you sure? He's like, yeah, no, I can't do that. He said, well, do you want to see what was in the mystery box? He's like, whatever. And so kid opens the box, $4,000 in the mystery box. Okay. He didn't get it. The kid walked away. Of course, he called the police. So who knows what was going on there? Anyhow, 
Don't you at least owe it to yourself to see what those holy plans are? I mean, you might be amazed. God, I guarantee you God's plans for your life are so much better than, than the best things we could plan for ourselves. Okay, some of us, we have to learn that the hard way. I mean, I guarantee there's people in this room, they got stories to tell, yeah, yep, I should have followed God's plans, okay? I missed on a, a, out about 20 years, but still God's plans are better and he even uses my mistakes, okay? As a pastor, I want to help you discover what those plans are. Not, not so we can have a bunch of people serving as hosts or making coffee or running the sound. That is not why, okay? It's because when you do, it makes you come alive. It, it, when you do, it makes you come alive. When you realize this is how God made me, the God of the universe, he has been designing, he's been, been, been trying to draw this out of my life for years and years and years. And when you finally had that moment, this is what I was made for. It's incredible, and I love to be there in the background and see the light come on in your eyes. I love to be there in the background and watch someone living out their God-given gifts and talents. I love hearing the stories. It's, it's, what, it was, it's what makes me come alive, okay? It's why I do what I do, because I love equipping the saints for the work that God has for that, That's That's the, the job description for pastor, okay? I'm the equipment manager, okay? You're all the team. Okay, newsflash, some people think the pastor is the one that does all the work. Nope, nope, I, I didn't make the team. I'm the equipment manager, okay? I'm going to hand you the baseball bat and, and the football helmet. See what I mean? I, didn't make, I don't even know the references. But, but God wants to use you to go out there and to win and to have a great time doing it. When we have one of those, I was made to do this moment. I think of the story of missionary and Olympic medalist, Eric Lindell. He said this, he said, God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. God made me fast. And when I run, I, I feel his pleasure. Which that tells me right there that God makes people different. Because I gotta be honest, I have never used the word run and pleasure in the same sense like ever, <laughs> okay? I mean, I feel something when I'm running, but usually it's like right about there, okay? It is definitely not pleasure. Okay, but, but when I sit down to have a conversation with someone and share God's truth, and as I'm talking, I just sense God giving me insights, giving me things to share, bringing scripture verses to my mind, bringing illustrations, creativity. And I see that light bulb come on. And I see God connecting someone's heart in a way they maybe never have before. When I see them connecting the dots of what's happened in their life to what God has been up to, it makes me come alive. When I sit down to write a message and I study God's word and I'm praying and I'm seeing the scripture come alive and I'm thinking about this group of people and I think they're gonna hear this and those aha moments and the illustrations that come, it makes me come alive and I want that for each and every one of you. God made me fast and when I run, I feel his pleasure. What is that in your life? Then when you engage in that area, you sense God's pleasure. He says, I, I, I was made to do this. And it, it may not be what we call spiritual at all. Now, I got a friend, he's an accountant, and, and he sits and he says, well, when I open a spreadsheet and I see that everything balanced out and everything is reconciled, I have that feeling. <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm glad that God made people like that because I am not one of them, okay? It may be something we would say is not spiritual at all, but when you do that, you sense that this, this is how God made me to be. I mean, you're a teacher and, and you see a kid and they, they finally get that concept. When you do something you love to do, when you go to the gym and you lift weights and, and you just feel great, that is the thumbprint of God because there's not spiritual and secular. God wants a full, okay? I mean, what if I told my wife, okay, there's marriage stuff and then there's Kyle stuff, okay? And I'll, I'll, you know, I'll share with you the marriage stuff, but the Kyle stuff, you know, I'm just... God wants to share your entire life. He loves the things that they give you energy. He, he loves watching you play video games. Not for eight hours, but he loves watching you play video games. Okay? He wants us to come alive. He wants us to come alive. And that's what I want for each and every person in this church. <laughs> that you would, you would find your fit and then, then we would get fit. They would find our fit, and then we would get fit. Because there, there are so many people 
that are walking around out of shape. Some are, some are bent out of shape, okay? Like, because of some of the, the things people have said to them, some of the things they've, they've experienced in life, some things they've walked through. It makes me think of recently I sat down with my kids and their readers, and so I went through a box of their books. They had to have some old books. Some we're gonna keep for, for uh, you know, their little baby cousin. Others we're gonna donate to Goodwill. And I was looking through this box of books. I found that old classic, The Ugly Duckling. You remember that book, right? Incredible story. Here's this mama duck. She's got, you know, four or five eggs. And, but one of them is a little bit, little bit bigger, a little bit different color. And the eggs start hatching. And all the little ducklings come out and they're waddling around, quacking around. But the little gray egg hasn't, hasn't hatched yet. So she has to sit on a little bit longer. Finally, the egg catches. But what comes out of it, it's not, it's different. It, it's, it's this like gray kind of, gnarly looking little little bird and all the other little little ducks start quacking you know they quack like ducks and this little bird but it's out a honk right doesn't sound like the other ducks the ducks are like what is that and they start walking to the water and he, he doesn't waddle like the other ducks this is weird and his neck is really tall he kind of really kind of up there and like he thinks he's better than us like well he's full pride hey get your so he kind of walks around like this right to fit in with the other ducks I said you're ugly you're an ugly duckling. And, and you're not, you don't, you don't walk like us. You don't quack like us. You carry yourself differently. We don't want you around. And so it tells the whole story about how he, he goes out, like so many have done, trying to find their fit. And no one seems to accept him. No one seems to, to, to be a good fit. He sees these birds in the air, these elegant birds in the air. And he's like, wow, they're incredible. They're so beautiful. And here I am, this, this ugly duckling. Until one day after the season passes, he goes to land in a lake and he, he notices there's this beautiful bird there on the, on the water. As he gets closer, he realizes that that's his reflection. And he sees the other birds and they, they invite him in and he finds out he was not an ugly duckling at all. He was a swan. He was a swan. Simple story. I, okay. Tell, I, was, I was tearing up a little bit. Okay. <laughs> okay as I was looking at these kids' books. But, but the reason why is there are so many well-intentioned people and some not so well-intentioned that are going around telling people, you don't quack like us and you don't walk like us and you gotta hunch way down so you fit in with us and, and we're gonna tell you what to say and how to be and how to live your lives. And there are so many people that are just conforming into those little boxes. And that is not what God has for us. God says, if you wanna know who you really are, quit looking at everyone else. Look up to me. Look up to me. See, I think there are so many people that are living with a spirit of rejection. The spirit of rejection. Words people said, things people have done, they pushed you out. You've not been a part. You felt like you were other or different. And for some, that led you fine, if I don't fit in, I'm going to go all in into this other area and see if you like me now. I'm going to, I'm going to identify with this. Spirit of rejection. But your father who knows you, knows all about you. From before you saw a single day of light, I got holy plans for you. Yeah, but look at, I, I messed up. I did. I got holy plans for you done yet. I'm not done yet. Proverbs says that when there's no vision, people cast off restraint. And I've seen that happen. We lose a vision for our life. We get, get kicked down and knocked down by things. And, and so we, we quit staying in discipline and we quit restraining ourselves and, and choosing what God has for us. And we get out of shape. But the good news is, as I believe we as a church, we as, as fellow believers, God wants us to be in the best shape of our lives. Okay, that's what we're gonna, that's what we're gonna be focused on, getting in the best shape of our lives. And that's not talking about, about your physical appearance. It's talking about your heart and your, and we're gonna get into that in the next, I can't wait. God wants to deal with our hearts but you have something that God has put his thumbprint on your life and he wants to use it. He wants to make it 
He wants to reawaken it and make you come alive. And I know there are some you're, you're afraid of that. It's, it can be a little scary. I'm not sure if I want to open that door again. God's not done. God is not done. He has got so, he's got holy plans for you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much. God, thank you that you shaped us, you formed us, and you are continuing to form us. What's, what's the end goal? That we'd be in the likeness of your son, Jesus. That's what you're shaping us to, that, that when, when we look at ourselves, we see Jesus. When we look at you, you see Jesus. That's what you're developing in our lives through our own unique gifts and talents and abilities and heart. And we, we don't get there separately. We get there as part of your body. God, I pray you'd help us to see that. Help us to pay attention, to, to recognize what you've been up to in our lives. God, we would say, okay, God, would you start showing me how this fits together? Would you start showing me my, my part of this plan? Because I want to be a part of what you're doing. As we're praying, there may be some, you've had that ugly duckling experience. Maybe not around your looks, but in some area, people have kind of pushed you away. And you have that, that rejection that's got stuck in your soul. With everyone's eyes closed, I, 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 wanna, I wanna take a minute and pray for you. I'm not gonna call you to stand up or come to the front. I just wonder who I'm praying for. I'm just gonna invite you to raise your hand and say, yeah, that's me. Yeah, that, that root of rejection. Hands all across the room. You're not alone. You are not alone. More importantly than me seeing you, God sees you. He sees, your heavenly father sees and he knows. He sees every, every instance of hurt and pain. You know, the enemy doesn't just try to abort in the womb. He tries to abort us all throughout our life. He tries to abort God's purposes. He tries to abort God's plans through, through the words people say, through the words left unsaid, through our experiences, but God, no purpose of God can be thwarted. That's what his word says. No purpose of God can be thwarted. God is, if you're not, if you're not dead, God is not done. So Father, I, I thank you for every person that raised their hand. I thank you for every person that wanted to raise their hand. God, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you, that you would strip off that spirit of rejection. God, that, that you, would, you would, Holy Spirit, you would birth in our hearts a spirit of sonship, of daughtership, that we are your sons and daughters, that, that we are loved and known and chosen, that you know all about us meaning the good and the bad, meaning our flaws, meaning the things that we would struggle with, meaning the mistakes we would make along the way. You already knew and you still chose us and you still sent Jesus. Jesus, you died for us. We are not rejected. We are chosen and greatly loved. God, would you just solidify that in our hearts that we would know that deep down that we are your sons and daughters. As we're praying this morning, there may be some though that you've never accepted that opportunity. That, that offer that God has invited you to, to be his son, to be his daughter. You've kind of been walking life on your own. You've been that, that ugly duckling, kind of trying to find where you fit on your own. But, but there is a God who knows your name. There is a God who knows everything about you, and he invites you into relationship with him. He wants to heal the, the scars that happened along the way. He wants to remind you of your purpose. He wants to forgive your sins and fill you with hope. This morning, if you've not received that offer. If you don't accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. So with everyone's eyes closed, say, I need to make that decision. I'm inviting Jesus to be the Lord of my life. Would you just raise your hand and put it down? I'm just going to give you a moment. I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Well, if I didn't see your hand, I'm about to talk to you at the end of the service. I'll be available at our connect table. I'd love to have a conversation about that. Father God, thank you so much for all you're doing in our hearts and our lives, making us more like you, Jesus, every day. God, we want to know you. We want to know you. We want to know your holy plans for our lives. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet. If you're able to, we're going to close with a time of worship. While members of our prayer team are on the sides, they would love to encourage you in prayer. But let's take these next few moments to allow God to speak to our hearts. Let's worship together.
Amen. Amen. Father God, Lord, we are so grateful. We are so thankful that you are unshakable. <laughs> that, that the things that cause us to shake, the things that cause us to worry and fear and doubt and be uncertain, God, you are not unshaken. God, you've already seen. Your word says you go before us. You already know you're not afraid and you promise to walk with us. That's what fills us with hope. God, hope that we are not walking alone. Hope that we, that we don't have to face this by ourselves. But God, as we walk out these doors, we know it's your spirit that walks with us. We know it's your spirit that gives us wisdom, that kind of whispers in, in, in our mind the right steps to take as we listen to you. God, the spirit that provides opportunities to be a blessing to those around us. Father, I pray that we would walk in step with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. And then God bless you. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. We will see you next Sunday. Have a wonderful week. Thank you.